It is good to see you tonight. Thank you so much for uh, making your plans to be with us and looking forward to have a wonderful service together. Well, we'll dismiss the children at this time, and they can be dismissed for their children's meeting. And uh, Austin will meet you uh, out the back as well as with the rest of my family. And if you have your Bible, would you join me in 1 Samuel 17? 1 Samuel 17. And sometimes it's, uh, uh, you come to a very familiar text and sometimes preachers, we tend to shy away from preaching on familiar texts uh, because we feel like, uh, well, everybody's already heard this story. They're going to toot it out as soon as you turn to it. But if you turn to 1 Samuel 17, you'll find that this is a very familiar passage of Scripture, that this is the story of David and Goliath that we're going to take a look at uh, tonight. And uh, just a passage of Scripture I've been meditating in uh, really for the last several years, and I've just been so encouraged by it. And I trust it will be a blessing to you. Uh, just a few things off the back table uh, that I'd like to encourage you to take a look at. I just recently finished this book, These Are the Days of Elijah, How God Uses Ordinary People to Do Extraordinary Things. And James said, if you remember James chapter 5, that Elijah was a man subject to like passions. He was a regular guy, just like you and me, and uh, it seemed like he was a strong man who was weak at the same time. He was filled with faith and with fear. Uh, he slayed 850 prophets of, of false prophets, but yet he ran from one woman. And those of us that are married, we understand that. No, I'm just kidding. And, uh, but, you know, it just seemed like it was a contradiction. And uh, he just struggled with the same thing. And I think, you know what, one of the major themes of the life of Elijah is how God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And God can use you. And uh, this little book will drive that point home. And I just was uh, so blessed by that. There's also another little book called Overcoming Temptation, Break Away from Captivity and Embrace God's Freedom. Don't let the size of the book fool you. Uh, it is filled with um, scripture and how you can have victory over every area of your life. There's not one sin you ever have to surrender to Satan. You can have victory in every area of your life. You can defeat temptation, not by your willpower, but through the power that rose Jesus from the grave. That's the same power that resides in you. And uh, the word can do that in your life. And so we sell that for $7. Let me encourage you to take a look at that. A newer book uh, that has been written by Roy Ortland is called The Death of Porn. Men of Integrity, Building a World of Mobility. Uh, you know what? Uh, we as men, and even ladies too, uh, we all ought to read stuff like this. Not because we have a problem with it, but because we don't want to have a problem with it. And you may have an issue with this, and, uh, and this ugly area of sin rises up. You can have victory. And this little book will help you uh, to uh, uh, really to help you in your battle uh, against porn. And you're not the first to struggle with it. You won't be the last. And sometimes... One of the myths of pornography is that we shouldn't talk about this in the church. Well, apparently nobody told the Apostle Paul that. Have you ever read 1 Corinthians? <laughs> he dealt with some very, very, uh, uh, some very straightforward things in 1 Corinthians. And it gives us some wonderful truth. And so we need, and so we need uh, God's help in that area. And so let me encourage you to get that. And, and don't be like, well, if I buy that book, everyone's going to think I have a problem with it. Listen, I encourage everybody to read that. And we all need the help. And then finally, one last little book. Um, it's called Your Daily Walk, 365 Daily Devotions to Read Through the Bible in a Year. This book has been one of my old friends. And I really uh, enjoy it because here's the book of Ezra. It begins with the book of Ezra. It gives you a, uh, an outline of the book. And so the first day of the book of Ezra, it gives you three chapters, but it breaks those chapters down thematically so you can see where it fits in the outline. And so what I found myself doing was outlining the whole Bible. So when I would look in the book of Ezra, I could always be reminded where I was and what was happening, what happened in the book, what was about to happen, where we're going. And there's just a little check mark at the bottom of there. Uh, but it has an overview. It has your daily walk. And then it has uh, just a little insight from the book of, uh, of Ezra. It has uh, the heart of the passage. And then uh, just a little quote there. And so the next day, you have chapters 4, 5, and 6. It's the same format, just a simple a little way. But I found these devotionals uh, have just been so very, very encouraging. And there's little things that they drop in here. Penetrating sermons from the prophet's pen. Gives you a little chart. So he gives you a little some gems in there from time to time. Uh, we sell this for 13 bucks. This will give you devotional material for the rest of the year. 
And uh, let me encourage you to look at that. And again, this has been one of my old friends for many, many years. My mom and I just went through it together last year. We were uh, reading that at the same time. And I would post things on Facebook. And she says, I know where you got that. We're reading that book together, you know. And, and, uh, but that might be something that may be uh, of, of interest to you if you want to get back in the Word. Well, would you look at 1 Samuel chapter 17. We'll read a few verses. We'll pray. And then we'll ask the Lord to help us during our time together. And would you look? At verse number 1, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and were gathered together at Shaka, which belong, belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shaka and Zechah and Evzdemim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah, and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a helmet of brass upon his head and was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. Would you look at, at verse number 10. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. I want to preach a message tonight entitled, Characteristics of a Conqueror characteristics of a conqueror. Father, would you help us tonight to be conquerors for Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would shake people out of an apathetic Christian living. Tonight, would you stir us? Would you help us to see your power and what you can do? Help us to see the great need for your people to get off the fence and get in the battle. Father, would you help us to walk with you in such a way where your power could be evident upon our life. Father, would you please do your perfect work Thank you in advance for what you'll do. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, Robert Wadlow was born on April 20, or February 22nd of 1918. And when he was born, he had a normal height and weight. He was one foot eight inches tall. He was eight and a half pounds, uh, eight and a half pounds heavy. But by the time that he turned one years old, his parents knew that there was something different about Robert Wadslow. When he was one year old, he was three foot six, 45 pounds. I mean, that's almost like, like giving birth to a kindergartner. You know, by the age of one, he's already that big. By the time he was five years old, he was five foot six, 140 pounds. By the time he was nine years old, he was six foot two, 180 pounds. Steph Curry is a two time MVP of the NBA. He's 6'3, 180. And this kid, Robert Wadslow, he's that basically at nine years of age. And then amazingly, when he turned seven, uh, 13 years old, he was seven foot four, 270 pounds. That's like having Shaquille O'Neal on your junior high basketball team. Man, that would have been awesome. By the time that he was 22 and a half years old, he was 8 feet 11, 439 pounds, and they called him the giant of Alton, Illinois. And Robert Wadslow is on record, it's the Guinness Book of Records, uh, he is the world's tallest man uh, that is known to this point. And so, really, when you think about it, we don't see guys like Robert Wadlow that that's big. And, but you know what, ladies and gentlemen, giants still fill our land. And they're not giants that are eight feet tall that are playing in the NBA, but they're giants of lust. And they're the giants of bitterness and fear and anxiety and judgmentalism and a critical spirit. And they're giants of impatience and envy and jealousy and discontentment and ingratitude, unthankfulness. And we may not have giants eight, nine feet tall walking around, but spiritually giants still roam our land. And sometimes we look at these spiritual giants in our life and we feel like no way I could ever beat these. And you know what? You can't, but God can. And God is looking for people in this, in this room, in this assembly, for you to be a conqueror for Jesus Christ. Notice with me several characteristics of a conqueror for the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you look back at 1 Samuel 17? In verse number 1, now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shaka, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shaka and Ezekah and Evzdemim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah, note this, and set the battle in array 
against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. When the Bible says that they just put the battle in array, you know what that means? They were just going through... Uh, the motions of kind of forming the troops, of getting ready to go into battle without actually going into battle. And we pretty much know, if you've ever been to Israel, we pretty much know exactly where they fought this battle. There is this uh, mountain range on either side. There's a valley between all the way uh, really back to the, to the east is Jerusalem where David was from. If you go down the valley this way to the west, uh, that's where Gath was. That's where Goliath was from. And you could actually in a clear day see those places and you could see that valley. And the Philistines were on one side and the Israelites were on another side. It's funny, if you ever go to Israel and you, they take you to the Valley of Elah, I'm leading a trip to Israel and we keep pushing it back with all this COVID stuff. And, but if you ever go to the Valley of Elah, everybody goes down to the, liver, to, to the little river brook there and they all draw out five stones. And then the tour bus leaves, and what they don't see is this huge dump truck pulls up and dumps a bunch of racks back into that valley, and uh, or back into that little brook there. And so it's just kind of how it is, but it's something to it's something to uh, remember your time there. And so we do know pretty much exactly where they fought, and it's almost like God is setting the stage, and there's going to be uh, the, there's going to be the heavyweight title championship fight. And he's got the crowd that is looking on, and everybody is watching as he sets this scene. But before we dive in to the main chapter, you know, and here is Saul. And all he is doing, he's just setting the battle in array. You know, Saul had two problems. Number one, Saul had a sin problem. He didn't follow the Lord, and guess what? The kingdom was being rent from him. If there is anybody out there that should have gone out there to fight this giant Goliath, it should have been Saul, but he had a sin problem. The power of God wasn't on his life. He also had a sight problem. He looked at this guy, Goliath, he thought, no way we can conquer this guy. You know, I travel all over this country, and you know what I find? That there are people in good churches just like yours that should be out in the battle, impacting people for the Lord Jesus Christ, but they got sin problems and they got sight problems. And they should be in the middle of the battle, but yet they're sidelined and they're just putting the battle in array. You know what the point is? Get off the sideline and get in the fight. Make a difference for the cause of Christ. But Saul, he was sidelined. And so we see in verse 4, and there went out a champion of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath. Goliath of Gath. That word champion is an interesting word that is used there. It literally means that he was a go-between. And so what they would do is they would fight in representative battle. And so as they would fight in representative battle, they would have uh, their main guy, uh, their best soldier, and they would fight against the best soldier uh, really of the, of, the other, uh, of the other nation, and they fought this way and represented a battle so that they didn't have to uh, sacrifice, uh, you know, maybe their, their, all of their armies, there wouldn't be a lot of bloodshed. It was represented a battle, and so it was a winner-take-all. And by the way, can I tell you the greatest representative battle that has ever taken place in the history of mankind is when God stepped out of heaven in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ over 2,000 years ago. And he went to a cross and he was doing something for you and something for me we never could have done for ourselves. And he died on the cross and he took your place. He was your representative. He died and his blood was shed for every time you cursed, for every time you looked at porn, for every time you got angry, every time you you got bitter. Jesus, he was being punished as if he had done those things, although he was innocent. And praise God, he who knew no sin became sin for us. And he, you know what, he, he suffered the wrath of God and he made a way that you can be forgiven. Jesus is the greatest champion to ever exist. The greatest representative battle to ever take place. But notice that he is a Goliath from Gath. It's interesting, when you read Joshua chapter 11, remember how God told Joshua to conquer all of that land, and he said all the way from the, from the river Euphrates to the Mediterranean, every place that the sole of your foot treads on, that is what I'm going to give to you, and you're to destroy everybody. Listen to what the Bible says in the book of Joshua. And at that time came Joshua and cut off the Anakims, those were giants, from the mountains, from Hebron and Debir and from Anab and from all the mountains of Judah and from all the mountains of Israel, 
Joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities. There was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel, Joshua 11.23. Only in Gaza and in Ashdod and in Gath there remained. So he utterly destroyed all of the giants, the sons of the Anakims, or the sons of Anak, the Anakims, and the, except in those places, just three of them, and one of them was, was Gath. You know what that means? If Joshua just would have had 100% complete obedience, they never would have been in the battlefield on this day. If he just would have been faithful and obeyed the Lord fully 100%, hundreds of years later, they never should have been on that battlefield facing a nine-foot giant that had been undefeated to this point. Friend, can I tell you, it's always better to obey God 100% and just to follow him exactly as he is prescribed, you can save so much pain and so much heartache and so much of the consequences later. But here it yields to us the very first point of a characteristic of a conqueror. If you want to be a conqueror for Jesus Christ, number one, conquerors don't let giants become giants. Conquerors don't let giants become giants. You know what a lot of people think? Oh, I've got this little sin problem. It's not that big of a deal. I think I can handle it. And you know what happens? Pet sins become killer monsters. Pet sins become killer monsters. You know, it's amazing if you go home and Google it. People are killed. Thousands of people are killed every year by their pets. You know, they're now finding down in the Everglades and in South Florida, people are buying these, these Burmese pythons. They grow to five, six, seven feet long, and they go, whoa, man, I can't handle this thing any longer. They release it into the wild, and they're finding 20, 25-foot Burmese pythons down in the Everglades. They're, they're, they're introducing a new species. It's destroying the ecosystem. Burmese pythons aren't indigenous to South Florida. They're from Burma. And so really, that has become a problem. These pet snakes, they get so big, they actually become killer monsters. In fact, one guy was bringing his dog into the vet, and he asked the vet, he said, hey, listen, I've got a six-foot python at home. Red flag number one. Right? (laughs) I've got a six-foot python. And he says, at night, the python slithers out of its cage, and it crawls, and it slithers into the bed next to me. Red flag number two. You're letting a python sleep in your bed, you got bigger problems. He said the python gets right next to me, stretches out, and and stays the whole night right next to me while the veterinarian says, you better bring that snake in. We have to relocate him or put him down. He says, why? What's going on? And the veterinarian says, well, the snake is actually measuring you to see if he could swallow you. I mean, that's just mentally disturbing. I don't even want to think about that, you know. And... Most adult problems, adults, listen to me, most adult problems were youth problems that were never solved. Think about one of the greatest spiritual struggles of your life as an adult. And you know what you can do in your mind? You could go back and you could see the seeds where you struggled with that. As a teenager, maybe as a young person and as a teenager, and then maybe through college. And you know what? Most adult problems are youth problems that were never solved. They never learned to be under authority. That's why they're 40 years of age. They can't hold down a job because they don't know how to respond to authority. It's why they they can't counsel their 15-year-old teenager to have victory over pornography in their life because they don't know how to have victory over it in their life. And you know what the fact is? Pet sins become killer monsters. And I'm telling you, the young people in this room, you're playing around with the pornography. You're going down the road of a physical relationship with some guy, some girl, and you run to the wine coolers. You dab a little bit in the pot and the marijuana, and you think, hey, these things aren't that big of a deal. And I'm telling you, these pet sins, they become killer monsters. And you are sowing seeds where you are destroying your life and your future marriage, and you don't even maybe know who your spouse is yet. Conquerors for Jesus Christ, they don't let giants become giants. 
And what sin is it in your life tonight? What private vice have you gotten comfortable with that you just kind of give a a pass to? Nobody knows about that. It's not that big of a deal. I can do this and be okay. I'm telling you, it's going to be the end of you. Conquerors keep short sin accounts with God. And as soon as they sin, they run to God, they confess that sin, and they radically amputate it out of their life. They go and they memorize those verses, they get accountability, and they root it out, and they go through all of the steps. And listen, if you'll do that, keep short sin accounts with God. Don't let giants become giants. Don't let these strongholds become strongholds. The devil's going to build them brick by brick. Don't let them have any bricks and cut it off at the very beginning. It's so much easier to get victory over some of these areas of our life the beginning stages rather than when the devil has built a fortress in your life. Conquerors don't let giants become giants. In verse 5, and he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. He had greaves upon I have greaves of brass upon his legs. These were like shin guards, and a target of brass between his shoulders. It was a curved scabbard, a sword. That he wore on his back, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of, of iron. That was 15 pounds. And one bearing a shield went before him. You know, really his, uh, his, uh, his armor weighed 125 pounds. And he stood and cried in the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Why are you just going through the motions? Am not I a Philistine and these servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, let him come down to me. If you be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. Liar. Because they didn't lose. Did they lay down? No. They probably thought that they wouldn't lose. And he says, then we'll be your servants. But if I prevail against them and kill them, then should be your servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Could it not be that there could be some in the room tonight? That there is just an area of your life, you just have a natural propensity, and you have just fallen over and over and over again. And you think, man, no way I'm ever able to have victory. As a young person, I thought there was no way I'd ever have victory over music in my life. Constantly running to the world's music and feeding upon that. I threw my music away so many times and go right back to it. Uh, Is there an area of life tonight, do you just feel like, whether it's anger or bitterness or lust or discontentment, that you just feel like, man, I have tried so many times. I'm telling you, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You can have victory. And by the way, this isn't even in the notes. You know what? My heart goes out to the teenagers in this room. I'm telling you, you Gen Zers, you're going to change the world. I really believe it. Man, your generation is going to change the world. You didn't choose to grow up in the culture that you're growing up in. And I'm going to be honest with you. You guys are facing some things as a young person I didn't have to face as a teenager. I went to college before Al Gore invented the internet. I'm so glad I did all my stupid stuff before Facebook, Instagram, and all that other stuff. But young person, I want you to listen to me tonight. You can live for God. You really can. And God can do some amazing stuff with you. And you see this champion of sin, Goliath, you see his height, you see his hardware, all of the armor that he has, you see his heresy and all the heresy that he threw out, but now you see his opponent, look at verse 12. It's almost like the scene is set, and here's the champion in this corner, now in this corner, verse 12, is the welterweight, the underdog, here's the challenger, verse 12. Now David was the son of that Ephratite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons, and the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn, next unto him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistines drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. Notice a few things about David. Number one, notice his age. He was the youngest. He was the run of the litter. When the prophet of God came to anoint the next king, 
Jesse gets all the other brothers, brings them in, and the Lord just got done saying, The Lord seeth not as man seeth. Man looks on the outer or an appearance, but God looketh on the heart. He said, Samuel, it's none of these. Samuel said, Do you have any more sons? He says, Well, yeah, I got one more, David. He's, he's out in the field taking care of the sheep. Really, in that culture, to take care of the sheep, that was the lowest job that you gave to the kids. That was the job that was looked at as the most insignificant. He didn't even think to bring him in. And as soon as David comes in, God says, that's him. Young people, you don't have to wait till you go to college before God could use you in some great way. God could use you right now in your Christian school to take a stand for righteousness. God could use you in the heart of that kid whose locker is five down from yours at the public school or that lives in your neighborhood. You don't have to wait till you go to college. Man, God could do some amazing things with you. Look what he's doing with his teenager right now, this young man, David. Notice his age, he was the youngest, but notice his army, he didn't have one. The Bible calls him later in the chapter a stripling. Now, what a stripling was, that was a young man that was old enough to be married, but he wasn't old enough to fight in the military. I guess they thought, if you can survive marriage, then we can put you on the battlefield. Maybe that was their boot camp, I don't know. So, so a lot of scholars believe that David was around the age of 17. In our minds, from our Sunday school days, we think of David as this like little eight-year-old boy. And that's not necessarily the case, especially later in the narrative. We're going to see another clue that really might tip us in that David was not just this eight-year-old. He could have been a 17-year-old or a 16-year-old. And so, and so it, he didn't have an army. Notice his assignments. He's playing the harp for Saul, and he's, he's watching the sheep. You know what? Again, young people, could I, could I just preach to you for a minute? You know what David didn't do? Just sit out there in the field and just pass the time by and saying, this is the most insignificant job. What am I really doing? This isn't making any difference to anything, especially eternity. And he could have just wasted his teenage years. But you know what he did? He became proficient with the sling. Because later in the text, you know what he says? There is a, there I killed a lion and a bear. They came after the sheep. I got proficient with that sling. And I knew how to kill a lion. I knew how to kill a bear. He came proficient with that sling, but he became proficient with the harp. When there was an evil spirit upon Saul, what harp player of all Israel did they go get? They got this guy, David. And so you know what he did? He disciplined his time and he developed his talents. And all he was doing was putting some tools in the back so that later when David would step into the greatest moments of his life, God was using some tools that he had put into the bag by disciplining his time and developing his talents so that he could shine for the glory of God. And you know what you ought to be doing as a teenager? Man, turn off Fortnite on your PlayStation. Man, get your nose into the book. Start disciplining your time. Start developing your God-given talents that God gave to you. And man, discipline your time. Develop your talents so that when you step in, maybe five to ten years from now, to the greatest moment of your life, you can shine for the glory of God. Man, discipline your time. Develop your talents. Every single one of you have talents and abilities. God didn't look down and said, oh, I forgot to gift you to do something. You know what? Before Jeremiah was ever born, he said, I knew thee and ordained thee to be a prophet unto all the nations. You know, God has a plan for you. Some of you young people, guess what? You, you, you are, uh, are, are really good athletes. You know what? That's a gift. Some of you are incredible musicians. That is a gift. I don't have that gift, but that is a gift. Some of you are really good at math, and that's super creepy, but whatever, you know. I mean, I might be working for you one day, you know. But, but here's the point. Discipline your time. Don't just pass it away from one fun thing to the next, although it's not wrong to have fun. But discipline your time, develop your talents. God's going to give you some opportunities, and you're going to shine for the glory of God. Be faithful, and here's another characteristic of a conqueror. Not only do they not let giants become giants, number two, they're faithful right where God plants them. 
And you know what God was doing with David? He was molding his man. He was just shaping him. And the things that David had learned during these times, boy, they came into play when he stood up against this, uh, this giant called Goliath. Maybe you're a young professional. Maybe you're out of college and, and maybe you just don't quite know what the Lord wants you to do. Or maybe you're still single yet. Or maybe you're an adult and you have kids and maybe you're just in a transition time of life. And, and maybe you're just not quite sure really what God, want, what God wants you to do. And you feel like all I'm doing in my job is just spinning my wheels. There's only lateral moves only. Could I just tell you, be faithful right where God plants you. Because you know what God is doing? God is a way of putting you exactly right where you need to be, and he's just maneuvering the pieces on the stage of the life to bring it to an incredible outcome. When you look at the life of Elijah, he confronts Ahab, but then he goes down to the brook Cherith. The word Cherith means to cut. It was translated in the Old Testament for divorce and meant to cut something or to separate something. He said the brook Cherith being fed by ravens, it was humiliating, it was an unclean animal. And he's there for a long time. And now, the next assignment, he goes to Zarephath. And that means, that, that means to smelt or to burn. And now he has a congregation of two. And he, he graduates from having nothing being fed by ravens. Now he has a congregation of two, the widow and her son. And he has to raise one of them back to life. I've been in some churches just like that. And you know all what God was doing? Just cutting things out of his life. And he was burning and melting some things out of his life. He was breaking his man. He was molding his man. And here's the point. If God can't trust you with two, he can't trust you with Mount Carmel. And maybe you're just in a position right now. You know what God's doing? Maybe you're at Brook Cherith. Maybe you're at Zarephath. Maybe you're taking care of the sheep. And, and maybe you're like in the position David was. You know what? Just be faithful right where God has planted you. If you take care of your preparation for service, God will take care of your place for service. And you may think all this is, is just for naught. What is God doing? You know what he's doing? Just be faithful where you are. He placed you there. And if you just let God have his way and he is moving the pieces on the stage of life, he is going to bring it to an incredible outcome. But what are you doing with your Brook Cherith or your Zarephath moment? Man, don't waste them. Mount Carmel is coming. The Goliaths are coming. Be faithful right where you are. And man, God will make you, he'll break you, and he'll produce a champion in you. Conquerors don't let giants become giants. They're faithful right where they're planted. But would you look at verse 17? And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now thy brethren and ephah for this parched corn, and these ten loaves, and run to the camp of thy brethren. Basically, for a better, a lack of a better way to say it, he's a pizza delivery guy. Hey, take this bread and these cheeses, go to the front line and, uh, and bring the food. Verse 18, and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand, and look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. You know what it's talking about? This was in the springtime. These men that were in the military, they should be preparing the fields to get ready to plant. And so the way that they would feed the military is the families would send food to the front lines and the soldiers had a pledge. It was like an IOU, and they would give it to their family members. And then later they could come back to the government of Israel and say, hey, listen, we donated food, and uh, here is our pledge, our IOU. And the government or the nation would repay them back for that food. It's just kind of the system uh, of how they do it. And that's what it means to take their pledge. And so David is, is just being faithful, doing what he was told to do. You know what an interesting thing is? David was so faithful in the little things. You know, God said, if you're faithful in the little things, he'll make you ruler over many. I mean, if these little things are just too small for you and beneath you, you're too small for the big things. Verse 20, David rose up in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. All they're doing is still going through the motions. <laughs> no fighting is happening. 
And again, doesn't that describe a lot of Baptist churches? There's a lot of activity. There's a lot of energy, but there's no power of God. And they're just putting the battle in array. Verse 23, and he talked with them. And behold, there came up the champion. So he sees his brothers, he's talking with them. The champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, spake according to the same words. And David heard them. This could have been the very first time David ever heard blasphemy. And man, he's like, who's that guy? And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. The men of Israel, verse 25, said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel he has come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king, will enrich him with great riches, and will give his daughter, give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. So you know what Saul said? Hey, anybody who has the guts to go fight this champion, I'm going to give you great riches. You're going to be able to marry my daughter. You're going to be in the royal family, and I'll make your, your house free of taxation. It's always been about taxes, hasn't it? <laughs> Can I just tell you, it's a sad day when God's people have to be motivated by carnal things to do spiritual work. They should have loved God so much, they should have said, I don't need any of that. We're going out and taking care of this guy. David fought, I believe David fought many battles this day. I don't even believe that the battle with Goliath was the hardest one. He fought a battle with Goliath. He fought a battle with Saul. We're going to see it in just a second. I believe the hardest battle he fought was with a lion. Isn't it sometimes the hardest people to live for God in front of are our families? They know all our weaknesses. They know all the warts. They could say, oh, yeah, but you do this, or you do this, or you had this failure. And sometimes the hardest crowd to live for God in front of is our family sometimes. Verse 26, and David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killed this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David is basically saying, why doesn't somebody go out there and do something? I mean, to David, the bigger the giant, the bigger dent in the pavement he was going to make. Verse 27, the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. Verse 28, and Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. I think Eliab was angry for a couple different reasons. First of all, I think he was embarrassed. Here is the kid brother that's not even old enough to be in the army. He hasn't even been there For the last 40 days, he doesn't know what's going on. He just shows up and basically reprimands everybody. He says, why doesn't somebody go out there? He probably was embarrassed. Oh, David, just be quiet. Hey, this is big boy stuff here. Why don't you just go take care of the sheep? He probably was a little bit embarrassed, but I believe he's not only embarrassed, but possibly, secondly, he was convicted and cut to the heart. I mean, here's a younger brother that has more of a faith, that has more of a love for God and greater bravery than he did. And maybe he felt like, man, if anybody should have been out there, Saul should, but it should have been Eliab. And here's the kid brother. And look what happens in verse 28. Why camest thou down thither? And with whom have those left those few sheep in the wilderness? He's belittling David. Who did you leave those few sheep with in the wilderness? Well, he already took care of them. He left the carriage in the hand of the keeper. He took care of all this stuff. I know thy pride. Now he charges them of sin. I know your pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. None of that was the case. And David said, what have I now done? Could you tell this wasn't the first rodeo with Eliab? (laughs) What is it now, Eliab? What have I now done? 
And then you see the phrase, is there not a cause? And this is usually where most people start preaching, is there not a cause? There's the cause for Jesus Christ and the cause for the gospel. We're going to be living for God. Man, is there not a cause? Listen, we see that later in the text, but the way this is translated in the Hebrew, he says, was it not just a word? He's saying, Eliab, can I not even say anything? What is it now, Eliab? And he confronts him, and then he moves on. Listen, conquerors, they don't let giants become giants. They don't tolerate sin in their life. They keep short sin accounts with God. They're faithful right where God plants them. But number three, conquerors don't fight critics. They fight giants. Could I say that again? Conquerors don't fight critics, they fight giants. Because anywhere there is a work of God being done and the power of God is being exhibited, there's always going to be the critics. And there's always going to be a crowd that's going to tell you you can't live for God. There's always going to be a, cr a crowd. They're the Johnny Rain cloud, and they throw a wet blanket on any vision that the church has to impact their community. And they're going to be the naysayers, and they're going to be the critics, and they're never happy with anything. And you know what? Don't waste your time fighting critics. Go out and fight some giants. If Eliab could follow a well-reasoned argument, then he wouldn't be leveling the charges that he is against David to begin with. And sometimes all we do is just waste our time arguing and fighting with all the critics, and all the while it's distracting you from the main battle that God wants you to be fighting. By the way, can I park here just for a moment? Young people, there's always going to be a crowd that says you can't live for God. You go to camp in the summertime, or maybe you even go to college, or, or in the summertime, you just get on fire for God. You go back to college, or maybe you come home from camp, and you get back with your friends and your youth group are back in your home, and they say, oh, yeah, you went to your little Bible college. You went to your little Bible camp. You got on fire for God. You know what? I give you two weeks, and you'll be back with the rest of us. And can I tell you, you can live for God, and don't waste your time fighting the critics. Go out and live for God. And you know what David does? He confronts them and then he moves on. Whenever you receive criticism in your life, could I encourage you to use the acronym LET, L-E-T. When you receive criticism in your life, number one, listen. Don't formulate your argument and how you're going to respond to it. Just listen. Listen. Sometimes the greatest help and in critical information or critical help you're going to get are from your enemies. You know why? Because they know that the truth is going to sting and they want it to sting. And maybe they're the only ones who are going to tell you the truth. Maybe the, all the other people, they don't, want to, they don't want to upset you or they don't want to be unkind. So they don't say anything. But here's your enemy and he's just throwing out the truth because he knows that it's going to hurt. You know what? Listen, sometimes the greatest help you are going to get is from your enemies. You listen. The E and L-E-T, let, you listen. Number two, you evaluate. You know what, is this really true of me? You go back to other people that know you, that don't have a dog in the fight, you say, hey, do I come across this way? Hey, have I developed this habit in my life? Hey, is this true of me? You evaluate it, you go to the scriptures and ask God to show it to you. And then the T, you take the good. You know what that is in your life? And maybe there are some steps that you could take. Man, well, that's great, well, I'm glad I know. We all have blind spots. If you knew what your blind spot was, it wouldn't be a blind spot anymore now, would it? Man, I didn't realize I had that blind spot. Man, maybe there's some work that God needs to do here. Or they might say, you know what, man, that's not true. You, They're just making stuff up, as in this case with, with David and Eliam. You take the good and you throw the bad. But you know what the point is? You don't stop and you don't focus on them. You keep pressing on for the Lord Jesus Christ. Conquerors don't fight critics. They fight giants. And so he confronts him, he moves on. 
Verse 30, and he turned from him toward another and spake the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard, when David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine. Everywhere he's turning, people are telling him, you can't do this. Don't listen to the crowd, listen to Christ. For thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. We know the text, let no man despise thy youth. Verse 34, and David said to Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. I'll tell you, when I read that, I thought, David's my kind of dude, man. That's a tough guy, I man, grabbing a line by the mane and killing it. Man, David's my crowd. And I went out after him and smote him in verse 35 and delivered out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine and Saul said unto David, go, and the Lord be with thee. He says, you know what? The same God delivered me out of the paw of the, out of, the paw of the lion and the bear is the same God that's going to deliver me here. And you know what another characteristic of a conqueror is? Is that they don't fight in their own strength. Number four, they don't fight in their own strength. They fight in God's strength. So many times after a revival week like this, or maybe after a week at camp for the teenagers. Man, we get, all, we get all excited. Man, God, there's some things in my life that don't believe there. Man, I don't want that in my life. I'm going to give that to you, and I want to have victory over whatever it happens to be. And you know what happens? You come home, and you say, you know what, God? I'm not going to do that sin. I'm not going to do that sin. I'm not going to do that sin. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to do that sin. Because you're trying to do it in your own willpower. What happens when your willpower is not enough? You know what Paul said? That these strongholds that are in your life, the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal. It's not your willpower. Power. They're spiritual. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And, you know, they say, preacher, I tried it, and it just doesn't work. You know, they mean living for God. You know, man, I tried it, and it just doesn't work. What's it? It's not God. Isaiah 40, he is strong and not one that faileth. You know what? It's not. It's not the Bible. Isaiah 55, 10 and 11, it doesn't return void to the purpose to which it is sent. You know what? It is us. And when you try to live the Christian life in your own strength, you know what happens? You will fail Every time. Failure is God's discipleship program. You know what he's showing you? Is that you can't do it on your own, man. You need him. Colossians 2.6 was a life-transforming verse for me. The Bible says, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. You know what Paul's saying? There came a day, if you're saved in this building, there came a day that you came to the jarring realization that you were lost. There was nothing you can do in order to merit heaven. You couldn't change your eternal destination, even if you wanted to. That there was nothing you can do. You were lost, and you were on your way to hell. So what did you do? You trusted in Christ to be your Savior. As ye have therefore received the, the Lord Jesus Christ, so walk ye in. And Paul saying, you know what? So too there comes a day as a Christian that you say, God, I can't live the Christian life in my own strength. You know what Paul said? The good things I want to do, I don't do them. The bad things I don't want to do, that's what I'm doing. Can you identify with that? Because I sure can. 
And he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death in Romans 7? It's like he throws in the white towel. He says, God, you know what? I just can't do it. And it's almost like God says, all right, Paul, now we can get somewhere. Because in Romans 8, he learns what it is to be filled with the Spirit and to be dependent on the total power of God. And you know what? He doesn't struggle with the sin anymore. And the same way you live the Christian life is the same way you got saved by faith. Our weapons, they are spiritual. They're not carnal. It's by faith. You trust in Christ to be your sanctifier. You trust in Christ to be your savior. You need to trust him to be your sanctifier. But so many times you say, you know what, God? No thanks. I'll do this myself. I'm good. And one of the reasons we fail is we're doing it in our own strength. Galatians 2.20, who do I now seek to persuade men or God? That's actually another part of Galatians. But he said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. So, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know what the very next verse says? For I do not frustrate the grace of God. You know what God's grace is? Yes, it's God's riches at Christ's expense. Yes, it's an unmerited favor. You know what grace also is? God's power for God's people to do God's plan. And when you are trying to do it in your own strength, you are frustrating the very power that God wants to give you for victory. And as I've said before, the great, the power that rose Jesus from the grave is the same power that resides in you. But friend, you got to fight, not in your own strength, but you got to be dependent upon him. You want to know how dependent you are on the Lord? How often do you pray? How often do you read God's word? Would you look at verse 38? And Saul armed David with his armor. And he put a helmet of brass upon his head, and he armed him with a coat of mail. It's interesting, Ken Ham. He thinks David was about the size of Saul, about 6'6". Saul could have easily looked over at David, and if Saul was 6'6", now, man, if this is an 8-year-old kid, my armor's not going to fit him. There wasn't a ton of armor back in Israel, but he knew, man, that's not going to fit him. See, from our Sunday school days, we think David didn't go out into battle because the, ar- because the armor didn't fit. But I want, you to, I want you to look at the text. And David girded his sword, verse 39, upon his armor, and essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said, I cannot, said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. See, in your mind, you think, oh, the armor just didn't fit. That's why he didn't go. That's not what the text said. It said he hadn't proved them. Saul could have looked at David. He's probably the same size. Ken Ham believes. And he put the armor on. He didn't go out because he wasn't familiar with those weapons going out into battle. And now he's wearing all of this armor. And maybe David would fight this lion and this bear being very nimble, being able to move and to cut quickly. Now he's weighted down with all this weight. It wasn't his fighting style. He wasn't used to that. He hasn't proved him. And you know what another characteristic of a conqueror is? Number five, or number six rather, they are proficient with their weapons. He'd already used the sling. He was very proficient with that. I believe God aided him and God helped him. But conquerors are proficient with their weapons. When you look at the spiritual armor that God has given to us, you know what the primary belief, prayer is a weapon. But you know what the primary weapon that God's given to us is right here. There's a certain tribe in Africa, when you become a man, you actually have to go out and kill a lion. And they teach you what to do. But this 13-year-old boy, he's becoming a man in the tribe. He goes out to the middle of the safari or the Serengeti, and he has a spear, and he gets down on one hand. He puts the end of the spear into the ground, lays it down. He knows that the lions are around. He knows that they're there. The lions are probably circling in the tall grass. They make sure that this young man is alone. Nobody else is there. This is an easy meal. And at the time he least suspected, this lion comes running out 20, 25 miles an hour out of, out of the tall grass. And every fiber in this kid's body is saying, man, you've got to get up and get out of here. He doesn't run from the lion because he can't outrun him. Well, he doesn't sit there and try to fight the lion and manhandle him. The lion's too strong. 
God, I trust his weapon. And man, as he's sitting there, all of this teaching he's probably had from his dad is just flowing through his mind. Man, just remember, just follow the plan. Be proficient with the weapon. Fight the way and trust the weapon. And just trust what I've been taught to do. The lion gets closer and closer and jumps up and is getting ready to pounce on this young man. And as the lion is almost on top of him, he raises the tip of the spear. The lion comes down on the spear and using the momentum of the lion, he rolls the spear over and at the same moment the lion hits the ground he uses that momentum and thrusts that spear into the heart of the lion, killing the lion. Isn't it interesting in 1 Peter chapter 5 that our Lord, through the apostle Peter, compares Satan to a lion? Be sober, be vigilant. Hey, don't you think Peter knows what it's like to be bit by the serpent? And he's saying, be sober. He says, wake up! Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary is not just pastor's enemy. It's not just my adversary. He's your enemy. He's after you. Your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, seeketh, seeking whom he may devour, and he is after to destroy your life. You know what? You can't run from him. You can't fight the devil in your, strength, in your own strength. You're not a match for him. You simply have to trust the weapon. And it's right here. Right now, could you quote to me three verses on the greatest sin struggle you have in your life? I mean, right now, the, the, the greatest sin habit you have in your life right now, could you just quote three verses without even thinking about it? Maybe that's why you struggle. Maybe because this book really isn't in your life. You know, some people read their Bible, they go, okay, I'm going to read this today. Okay, great. Geneal genealogies in Second Chronicles for five chapters. Oh, that begat Jesse, Jesse begat. You know, that's like fighting the devil like this. That's like taking a 50 cal machine gun, just spraying the wood, saying, man, I know the enemy is out there somewhere. If I just shoot long enough, I might hit him. How much better would it be if you were to go out to the woods and say your enemy is behind that tree right there? Now you can take that 50 cal, unload the ammo box, saw the tree down, and hit your enemy with a greater degree of effectiveness. Don't just randomly read God's word. Go to parts of God's word that have to deal with what you're struggling with. When I go to the doctor and I have strep throat, I don't want him to give me a vaccination for polio. If your doctor does that, you need a new doctor. You know what? You want to get the medicine that has to correspond to where your sickness is or what's going to help with that sickness. You know what? Every one of you ought to have trigger verses. Verses of God's word that you can run to that deal specifically with the thing that you're dealing with. I was preaching in Savannah, Georgia a number of years ago. A guy walked up to me and said, Preacher, I watched two movies. I cannot get some of these images out of my brain. And there are some people in this room, you know exactly what that guy's talking about. David said, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. And there could be people in this room, you could bring up a, a, a specific image of your mind, of a website, of a movie, or something that you watch, you can bring it up as clear as day. I said, Ron, how did you help that guy? I took him to Psalm 119, 9 through 11. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my heart have I sought thee. Let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. And you know what? There are trigger verses. And, and, and you know what the word is saying in Psalm 119? It's like spiritual tide. How do you get those images out of your brain? Several years ago, I was preaching down in Florida in January. I believe it's God's will for every evangelist to be in Florida in January. <laughs> you see the rigs that we, we drive. I pulled into the truck stop. And can I remind you, the pillars of the community don't necessarily hang out at the, at the truck stop. I went to pay for my diesel, and on the counter was a Wicked magazine, and it was open. And you know what your brain does? <laughs> Takes a picture. I'm like, great, I don't want that in my mind. So you know what I did? I walked out to my truck. I just went through my trigger verses. 
Job 31, 1, I've made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Lamentations chapter 3, mine eye affects my heart because of the daughters of my city. Psalm 101, 3, I will send no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work and then to turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Philippians 4, 8, violent brethren, whatsoever things are. And I just started to go through my trigger verses. Listen, by the time I got to my truck and I cranked that diesel engine on, I could not remember what was sitting on the counter of that truck stop. And that's the power of the word. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Ephesians talks about being washed with the water of the word. David said through thy word that was quick in me. And oh Christian, we ought to be proficient with our weapon. How proficient are you? Do you read it every day without miss? Do you meditate on it every day without miss? Do you memorize it every day without miss? Man, get your face out of Facebook and get it in his book. Man, be proficient with the weapon. Just one more and I'm done. Notice what happens in verse 40. And he took his staff in his hand and he chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and he put them in a shepherd's bag which he had even in his scrip and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine and the Philistine came on and drew near unto David and the man that bare the shield went before him and when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. Everywhere David turns, they're telling him, you're a young person, you can't live for God. And the Philistine said unto David, am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and of the beasts of the field. In verse 45, then said David to the Philistine, thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. He wasn't fighting in his own strength. He was dependent upon God, the God of the armies of Israel whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand and I will smite thee and the carcasses of the hosts of the Philistines this day into the fowls of the air. This is I will give the carcasses of the hosts of the Philistines this day into the fowls of the air, into the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. There's, there's, that's where there's your causes. What would possess anybody to go out and to fight this 10 foot tall giant? David was so in love with his God. He didn't care what the crowd said. He didn't care what the circumstances were. He didn't care what the obstacle said. He was in so in love with his God. And he was committed to God's cause, not his very own. In verse 47, And all the assembly shall know that the Lord save and not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass, verse 48, When the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. I saw an article one time that, that said, what do you do if you're ever held hostage by gunpoint in a bank robbery? And I thought, what do you do? I mean, it was nothing more than clickbait. And I thought, man, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Man, I better find out. So I click on it. And you know what they said? If you're held at hostage at gunpoint, that probably snipers are already there, SWAT snipers. You are to move your head as far away from the assailant that is holding a gun to your head because in sniper school, in that situation, do you know where they train the snipers to aim? If you were to draw a line across your eyebrows and then go down to an upside down triangle to the point of your lips underneath your nose, that's what they call the kill box. If a bullet were to enter into there, immediately it paralyzes that person. So even in a reflex, they're not going to pull the trigger. It just drops them right there. Isn't it interesting where God put the rock through David? We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Don't tell me God doesn't know our bodies. And here is a kid against all odds who they said was impossible with one rock. He doesn't even physically touch this giant. And with one rock, God puts him in the dirt. 
And you know what Israel is learning? It's not about the weapons. It's not about your might. It's about him. And this is my, one of my favorite parts of the text. Verse 50, so David prevailed over the Philistine with his sling and his stones and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. I took a storytelling class with Doris Harris at the Bible college that I went to. And and I was preaching in the uh, in the elementary school of that college. And and so she said, Ron, when you go preach on David and Goliath, there's little kids in there at kindergarten. Just leave out this part, uh, you know, of him cutting off the head. She wasn't telling me to cut out parts of scripture. Just just don't be graphic, you know, because, that, you know, that's, you know, that's kind of that's really graphic, especially for a little kid. So there's like a thousand kids at this elementary school, and I'm preaching on David and Goliath, and I gloss over this part, and there was a little girl on the front row. Her feet didn't even hit, touch the floor. She was just swinging them the whole time, just this little girl kindergartner well i skipped over this part and then she stood up on her chair and out loud says yeah and then they cut his head off (laughs) and my teacher was in the back and and she's going like this i'm like don't dog my grade from that kid i didn't say it she did and they cut off head and they and they cut off his head and notice the end of 51 and when the philistines saw their champion was dead they fled My favorite part of the text, verse 52, and the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Sherem, even unto Gath. They chased them all the way back to Goliath's hometown, knocking on his home door, and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. As soon as they saw what God could do with someone who was just surrendered, all the critics rose up. All the cowards who thought this could never happen rose up. All of those doubters, you know what? They rose up. And you know what the last characteristic of a conqueror is? Is that conquerors are contagious. And if you take a stand for God, I'm telling you, you are going to be challenged. But I'm also telling you this, if you're just faithful, it's going to be contagious. When you read the book of Daniel, there's only one dude, Daniel says, I'm not eating that meat, I'm not drinking the fruit of the vine, I'm not drinking that alcohol. And he takes a stand. When you get to the end of the chapter, there's three more that says, that's my crowd. I remember when I went to Bible college, I was at, after soccer practice, there were four or five guys that just got, uh, just after practice, we didn't have to be there, it wasn't some official thing. They said, hey, one of the guys said, hey, would you pray for my dad? He lost his job and I'm going to have to leave school. Another guy said, hey, would you pray for my parents? They've been unfaithful to each other, they're getting a divorce. Another guy said, hey, pray for my mom. We just found out she has cancer. And as an 18-year-old, I'm on my knees. with the, They just started to pray. I was like, okay, got down on my knees. And, and they just started to pray. And they started to weep. And they just started to beg God that he would step in, that he would heal, heal that guy's mom of cancer, that he would deal with those unfaithful parents and just work in their heart. And maybe, God, would you provide a, a job for, the, for this guy's dad that he could stay in school and train for the ministry? You know what? That semester... If through the power of prayer, we saw that guy's mom healed of cancer when into remission, never came back. That other guy's parents, the mom and dad, got right with God. They're still together tonight. That guy whose dad lost his job, he got, a, he got another job, an even better job with more pay. And for the first time in my life, I was with some people, some peers my own age that knew how to get a hold of God. And you know what I said? That's my crowd. 
I don't know about all these others, but man, that's my crowd. Could I ask you, how contagious are you? Are you just one of those critics? Are you just one of those cowards? Are you just one of those that are just sitting in the sidelines? Let me tell you, get in the battle. Trust God. Go out and fight some giants. Live for God. And I'm telling you, it's going to be contagious. And God's looking for more in this room to go into your workplaces, to go into your communities and be contagious for the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be a conqueror. You don't let giants become giants. And you're just faithful right where God plants you. And you don't fight the critics. You go out and fight giants. And you are dependent in God's strength. And you become proficient with your weapon. And you're contagious. You can be a conqueror for Jesus Christ. A coward or a conqueror. It's your choice tonight. Characteristics of a conqueror. Would you stand quietly as we pray? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for liberty as I've preached tonight. And God, I pray you would just do your work tonight. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, could it not be tonight that there was a specific sin? Man, God just moved you tonight. Did not anything resonate in your soul tonight? Maybe there was a specific sin that tonight you would just, maybe you just say, you know what, God, I'm done with it. God, I don't want this in my life. And maybe you would give that to God afresh and anew tonight, whatever it happens to be. It could be a sin I didn't even preach on tonight. Maybe you haven't been keeping short sin accounts with God. Maybe you've been fighting all the critics and looking at all the crowd instead of fighting the giants. Maybe, you know what, your decision tonight would be just to get proficient with your weapon. Maybe even in the beginning of this year, you haven't been faithful every day in God's word. Maybe your decision tonight would be to faithfully be in the God's word every day. There's resources out on those tables that will help you, whether you're a teenager or whether you're 90. Man, get into the word. Maybe you've just been living life in your own strength. And you just felt like you'd been beat down over and over. And you know what God's just showing you? Man, you can't do it. You need me. Man, just invite me. I'll help you. Just abide in Christ. Man, he'll give you the strength. Just just run to him. And maybe that would be your decision tonight. Maybe it would be to get your own trigger verses. What is your next spiritual step with the Lord tonight? Where are you with the Lord? Would you just take that step tonight? His heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I wonder if you're here tonight. You say, you know what, preacher? There was something in the message that I needed, and God spoke right to me. If that's you, would you just raise your hand along with mine? Would you just do that? Praise God for you. Praise God for you. Many, many here tonight. In just a minute, the piano is going to begin to play. Could I just encourage you, just take maybe 30 seconds or a minute, and would you just talk to the Lord? Just give him that area. Ask him to help you. Ask him for the boldness to take a stand for righteousness or whatever decision that you need to make tonight. But you can be a conqueror because there is a risen Savior. In just a minute, the music will begin to play. Could I encourage you, if God spoke to you, for just to leave your seat and just to find a quiet place here at the front, maybe on your knees, or, and just right here, just make a private place with the Lord. His heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm going to invite the piano to begin to play. As the piano is playing, if God spoke to you, would you just slip out and come? You know what, preacher, I want to be a conqueror for Jesus Christ. Just come on. Just would you do it? Just step out where you are, find a quiet place, and would you just talk to him just for a moment? Praise God for you. are physically able to walk an aisle. You can have a seat where you are. God will meet you there. But if you could, would you just come? He's so good. He can give you the victory. Be strong in the Lord and be of good courage. He can strengthen you and he can win. Would you just run to him tonight?
right, you can look this way. Do appreciate your being in the service this evening.